Hi there, welcome back to IndyCar. It's the 19th of June. Now, I promised you I uh, would do a programme today on Sunday, and here it is. Um, it's interesting to watch the news media at the moment because I counted at least eight pro-union or pro-UK uh, news media items which were banging on constantly <coughs> about the fact that they can't see how the Scots can hold an independence referendum without first asking the permission of the British state. The claim is that um, because the first independence referendum in 2014 was conducted after uh, Alex Hammond and David Cameron negotiated the uh, transfer of powers from the British government to the Scottish people for a day, uh, meant that th this was the only way of doing it. Now, the British state uh, is either deliberately re refusing to acknowledge it any other way, or its television media is entirely ignorant of the fact that there's more than one way for a country to gain its independence. And this has been the case um, for decades. In fact, for most of the last two centuries, um, it has been the case that countries wanting to leave the United Kingdom can do so, and not necessarily uh, using strictly democratic means, as we've seen in many cases before. But this absolute obsession with Section 30 is fascinating. Every single uh, British news media says the same thing in the same way. The Scots can't possibly have an independence referendum without a Section 30 order. How else are they going to do it? And they don't actually seem to know or even care whether there is a way of doing it. But there is, obviously, another route. Otherwise, the SNP would be unable to say that they're going to hold an independence referendum in 2023 in the first place. And of course there is a way of doing it. And it's very simple. I've outlined it many times before. But also we've seen Murdo Fraser giving interviews, um, and mostly I've seen these on news media on the social media. In, in these strange uh, interviews Murdo Fraser has given, and remember that Murdo Fraser has never won an election in Scotland as a representative of the British Tory party in his life. He's always had the wooden spoon, the consolation prize of getting a list seat simply because the voting system is set up so that he is guaranteed a seat virtually every time. But Murdo was going on about, in his view, uh, <laughs> This is the most bizarre thing of all, that um, without Britain, or in, 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 in actual fact, without England's mighty shoulders, Scotland wouldn't be able to keep things like the North Sea oil flowing. It wouldn't be able to have its um, offshore wind turbines. It wouldn't be able to exploit its gas reserves. And all of these things would be lost because only England is capable of exploiting these resources on our behalf. What a load of nonsense that is. Murdo Fraser actually gave an enormously long list of the exact reasons why Scotland actually does need to be independent. Because at the moment, it is losing all of these resources to England, which is basically allowing uh, international companies to exploit these resources for buttons. We get nothing back in return for it. So murder, mur murder, murder Fraser, he gave an excellent reason why we should be independent. In fact, he gave several in fantastic reasons why we need to be independent without even realising the irony of what he was saying. And then we come to the issue of the border. Now, this is the other thing that the news media has been banging on and on and on about. Even when Alex Salmond was interviewed uh, many times, in fact, by British media about what happens with the border. And surely this is a really bad idea because Scotland would have to have a hard border with England if it was trading with the European Union. And of course, that's not the case. Um, for a very simple reason, it's called the free travel area and it exists across the entire British Isles. So even if Scotland did become independent, and even if it did become a full member of the European Union, the only barriers on our border would be side lanes for trucks to be checked randomly to make sure that what they're carrying tallies with the paperwork. The rest of the border would remain exactly the same as it is now, and people in cars travelling to visit one another would be able to cross unhindered without flashing their passports or requiring visas of any sort, because that's the law. And nobody, 
uh, even the English government has ever thought of repealing the act which created the free travel area. It's part of the British Isles and it's part of these entire, this entire archipelago of islands has a common travel area for all of its citizens regardless of whether they're in the EU or not. That is not going to stop. So the border is another false uh, assumption that there would be a disadvantage to independence. But as Alex Salmon said, the pros outweigh the cons, even with a semi-soft border where you're just checking trucks. The massive amount of trade that is opened up with 500 million people in Europe overnight versus the, what, maybe uh, five Sorry, maybe about 50 million in Britain, which is which would remain after Scotland leaves. 50 million people versus 500 million people is a tenfold increase in Scottish trade overnight. And that's assuming also the fact that we would continue to trade with the 50 million in England anyway, because our borders would not be completely closed. All of this seems to go flying over the heads of the British media. But of course, one of the other things that the British media is assuming is that Scotland would be fighting this battle alone, and it's not going to be doing that. One of the other problems that um, Tory politicians particularly are irked about is the fact that the Scottish Parliament, in fact the Scottish Government I should say to be more accurate, has kept open trade missions um, with other European countries and it's kept contact with those trade missions, with those embassies, with those representatives of the European Union so that we can discuss the continued trade, in fact, after Scotland becomes independent, so that we can keep trading with Europe and set up new trading routes, <coughs> not just the ones we had before when we were part of the UK, but extending them and improving them. And the Tories don't like this either. They say it's a terrible waste of taxpayers' money that the government of Scotland should be preparing, as it is, for the massive increase in free trade with the European Union after independence. He thinks this is a waste of money. Frankly, I think this is an investment in the future. And far from being a waste of taxpayers' money, this is thinking ahead. Then there's the issue of defence. This is the other stick they like to beat us with. But experience in Ukraine has shown something interesting, and that is that nuclear weapons do not prevent wars. Otherwise, the war in Ukraine would not have happened. The Ukrainians gave up their nuclear missiles in a deal with the West, with NATO, uh, in order to defuse tensions with Russia. Plainly, like that didn't work. The Russians saw that as a green flag or not a green flag, but a, basically a, a green light to invade Ukraine and take back whatever parts of it they wanted using conventional weapons. And this means that the British state, which has its nuclear loading system uh, and its submarine base in Scotland, has painted an enormous target on Scotland as being a first strike target in a nuclear exchange with Russia. Scotland does need to be in NATO after we become independent for a very, very simple reason. If we're not in NATO and we do not have the, the nuclear weapons on our soil anymore, then we are open to the same kind of attacks that Ukraine has been because we would not be covered by the, uh, the agreements of NATO, which, which basically are if, if Russia attacks one NATO member, whether they have nuclear weapons or not, then all of the other NATO countries would come to their aid. So Scotland can stay in NATO, even without nuclear weapons, but it would need to rearm itself with a much more effective defence system against things like, for example, cruise missiles fired across the North Sea. At the moment, the United Kingdom has absolutely no effective defensive screen against such attacks. So when Scotland becomes independent, its defence posture would need to change, but it would need to remain part of NATO in order to gain the protections that that would uh, confer upon us. Although I don't like the idea of nuclear weapons, and I think that Scotland should denuclearise, we do need to rearm ourselves in an effective way that would prevent such attacks on our infrastructure, because most of our energy comes from the North Sea. That's hundreds of miles offshore. It's not protected by the United Kingdom in any way at the moment, in a conventional sense. So we would need to design our own systems, our own low-level, narrow aperture radar, for example, ways of creating crossfires to shoot down uh, 
potential Russian cruise missiles which basically hug the sea and are very, very hard to shoot down using conventional anti uh, air defence systems, as we've seen with Ukraine. So there would be a need for Scotland to develop its own new defence capabilities, and that would re require us to have a good shipbuilding industry. We'd need to build our own, possibly our own submarines. We would not be nuclear arming them, however, but we would need to develop our own anti cruise missile systems and other methods of defending ourselves against conventional forms of attack. So these things are true. There would be a change in the defensive posture of Scotland that would need to change in order to be effective against aggression by uh, by the Russian Federation. Now, the Russian Federation is very dangerous at the moment because it thinks it has a, a free uh, go at Ukraine just now. And I think the Ukraine situation will end in a stalemate and an armistice eventually because the, the flood of weapons from the West into Ukraine will eventually create a, a standoff which can't be resolved any other way. Maybe that will happen in the next few months. I hope so. I hope the war in Ukraine ends fairly soon. However, all of these things taken together actually leave out a very important factor when it comes to our independence referendum. That is that, first of all, it's our independence referendum. It requires no permission. It will be legally uh, completely above board because it, it's going to be worded in such a way that the result of the independence referendum makes no mention of the British Constitution at all. It doesn't affect it. It is an advisory referendum where the people's voices are heard and we can say whether or not we wish to stay in the Union. Now the reason I say that we're not fighting alone is that the Council of Europe, this is the body which contains all the leaders of the European Union's nations and their job is effectively to make sure that countries like Scotland, small countries like Scotland, which are part of larger groups like the United Kingdom, for example, have sufficient democracy inside that construct. And this is why, and it's the only reason why, the Scottish Parliament actually exists. Neither of the main British parties in the UK wanted Scotland to have devolution. It was forced upon them by the Council of Europe, who said that the Scots did not have an effective democratic voice at all, uh, and insisted that both Labour and the Conservative Party give Scotland what it wanted after its first referendum was a huge success and more than two-thirds of Scots voted for devolution, if you remember, back in the 1990s. And that is why we have now got an elected government in Scotland, one which is legally entitled to hold referendums to ask people questions about uh, important national uh, issues such as do we wish to stay in the Union or not. It also means that the European Union is largely already working in Scotland's case here because they will be watching to make sure that the Scottish independence refer referendum is allowed to happen freely and fairly and that the end result of it is entirely democratic regardless of whether any of the Unionist parties decide to boycott it. Because by boycotting it, all that demonstrates demonstrates is how big the no side was and the fact that it has decided that it is not going to actually object to independence in an official referendum and that means they cannot gainsay the result. The European Council of Europe would, I believe, be watching very carefully to make sure that the Scottish referendum is not tampered with in the same way that it was in 2014. It's well known that IDOX, which was the one of the well, was a company which was tasked with counting postal votes in 2014 and which was or which had as one of its major directors a senior Tory figure was definitely not impartial and there were a lot of irregularities in the postal voting system it's also interesting to, sit, to remember that the votes which were cast during the Scottish independence referen referendum were almost immediately destroyed before anyone could go back and recount them and to check the validity of each one of those ballot papers. That will not happen this time because, as I've said, the Council of Europe will be watching to make sure this happens. The United Nations will be watching to make sure that international standards of democracy are maintained in Scotland and that the referendum is entirely free and fair and the result is legitimate. Then that just means that the only people who would object 
to the result of it would be England and people of course like Murdo Fraser and Anna Sarwar but then again we would expect that so the point I'm trying to make here is we're not fighting alone here we are fighting with the the tacit approval of the United Nations and with the approval of the Council of Europe and with the ongoing interest of all of these European trade missions who want Scotland to be back in the European Union. Whether it is through the European Free Trade Association, which is a much faster route back to trading with Europe, albeit not full membership, and we know that the European Free Trade Association has already intimated that it would accept Scotland's yes vote as if you like, the starting point for restarting trade. And Scotland could be welcomed straight back into European trade through the Free Trade Association because they, first of all, would give legitimacy to Scotland's yes vote. And that would trigger le the legitimacy of Scotland's vote with the Council of Europe. Because if one trading organisation, which contains at the moment, I believe, four countries, were to expand themselves and accept Scotland, then that shows that Scotland's democratic will has been listened to and accepted by these other nations. The European Union would then be forced to say, well, OK, if the Free Trade Association accepts it, we'll accept it as well and welcome Scotland back as a trading partner. Then the work begins because then the British state, or in fact, I should say the English state, because they are the ones with whom we have the treaty, would then need to decide whether they were going to continue to uh, deny that Scotland has had this vote and deny that it's legitimate and trail the you know, basically drag their feet as they usually do, and thereby sparking a massive trade war with European Union, which they're already planning to do it anyway, or not. I think what we'll end up having is our independence with the United Kingdom still in denial for years afterwards about the status of Scotland's vote. But the reality will be that Scotland will start trading with the European Union. The reality will be that the United Nations will accept it. And the reality will also be that Scotland will denuclearise. And this could take a while because the British government is not going to like this. They're going to have to find a new location to load their submarines with nuclear weapons. And Scotland will have to design its own new conventional defensive forces in order to counter any threats, as I've mentioned, from the Russians who seem to be emboldened by what's going on in, in the Ukraine. So things have changed dramatically for independence. And we need to remember that we're not fighting on our own this time. We have 500 million Europeans fighting with us. We have them wanting us back. We have them telling their politicians that Scotland should be back. And we have the Council of Europe, which is making sure that the democratic will of the Scottish people is respected, because that is what the Council of Europe is there to do, to ensure human rights and democracy prevails across all member states and potentially member states of the European Union. Remember, Scotland is an ex-state. It already still has the same high standards as the European Union. We've never dropped our standards, despite the fact that the British government wants to drop its standards in order to do shady deals with strange countries, uh, probably with equally autocratic uh, governments. So Scotland is in a prime position to do this. And it is an open defiance of the English government, and it will always have to be that way. Scotland will still have to take its independence after it has a yes vote. But people like Murdo Fraser have explained in great detail what Scotland will win back, despite the fact that he thought he was making the case for the Union. So it is still very good news for Scotland, and we are going to win. And the British media doesn't know what to do about it. They can't see what we can see. They are sticking their heads in the sand and saying, but you must ask our permission, but you must ask our permission. You can't do this without our permission. What a load of nonsense. They just do not realise that we have far, far more allies than they do. In fact, the British government itself is so unpopular amongst the international community that nobody is wanting to do trade deals with them at all. And in fact, the only reason the Rwandans would take uh, potential asylum seekers off the UK is because they're actually exchanging asylum seekers of their own. 
who they say are vulnerable in Rwanda and exchanging them and sending them to the United Kingdom. But this is not being made public. The United Kingdom has done a deal basically to swap refugees with Rwanda. We get Rwanda's refugees whom they don't want and Rwanda gets our refugees whom the British government doesn't want. And in many cases, nobody knows that this is going on because it's not being made public. The fact that the deal that was done is actually an exchange. It's not a one-way system of traffic. Anyway, that's about it for me today. I'm glad to see the, the viewing figure still up at, ooh, 160. So we're still looking very healthy today. You're obviously still feeling optimistic. Good, you should feel optimistic. The next paper that comes out uh, on the independence, um, what are they calling it, the prospectus for independence, should reveal a lot more about how the referendum will happen. We now know when it's going to happen, and it will be in October of 20. 23. So there's no doubt in my mind that this is good to go ahead. The question now is just convincing the few percentage points of people who were swithering last time and maybe reluctantly didn't vote yes last time because they were scared by unionist lies. This time the unionist lies have already been exposed. We know that they're not true. We know that the European Union, the only way we can get access to it is to leave the United Kingdom, to leave Brexit land. We were lied to. Uh, we, we thought we were voting to remain in Europe by remaining in the UK. Now we know that by remaining in the UK we have been pulled out of Europe. And the only way back to it is to dump Brexit land. And if we dump Brexit land, we regain 500 million new friends and 500 million new customers for Scotland's massive amounts of exports. It's all good. There is nothing bad in any of this. Everything to play for. Scotland has the whip hand here and we need to get on with it. I'll see you soon. Have a great weekend. In the meantime, I'll see you on Monday. Bye for now.